Welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about painting some warp stone glow <clears throat> so here i have another base for a rat for a little skaven sneaky fellow and we've got a couple crystals buried in the ground here that we're going to do like warp stone so uh, our goal here with warp stone is like a normal gem we need to run a lot of different colors. Uh, and a lot of the same tactics you use with gems are going to apply here. So in general, what I mean is like, when you look at a gem, the light comes in from the top. So the top is actually the darkest because the light is collecting along the bottom of the gem. So you have your light point at the top and then your lower area is brighter. So we're gonna follow a lot of the same rules here. Uh, so I've got some paints on my palette here. Running from darkest to lightest, we've got our old friend Payne's Gray, our blue-black, always a nice useful ink. We have some emerald green, which is a color I really love as far as Dalarani goes. Got some War Colors fluorescent green. We have some Scale 75 Marduk yellow. We have some Vallejo Game Ink green, straight green. And then, I guess, sorry, I switched those around. That's actually the green ink. I should have done that second. I'm sorry. And then we have uh, some bright ivory from Pro Acryl. As always, none of that matters. You can use whatever color you want, as you know, some dark. I, I, the Payne's Gray is pretty good, like I would highly recommend it as a shadow color, but in the end you don't even have to use that. Um, you know, some kind of greens, some kind of fluorescent, a yellow to keep everything in, this, in that spectrum, and a bright white, but an ivory of some kind, again. Nothing about the paints I use is magical. Nothing about the paints I use is special. Anything you like that's close to this is correct. So, we're gonna start out, we wanna take a little bit of that emerald green and we're gonna mix a little bit of the regular green ink in there and just grab a dab of that fluorescent just to get some regular paint in there. Okay, and we're just gonna lay down a nice even base coat over the whole gem. Now, I'm purposely picking something that's in my mid-tone here. The reason I'm gonna, the reason I'm, I'm choosing, you notice that when I, I went ahead and primed this base, I focused these to be very white, even though this was, you know, more or less kind of zenithal, but in this case, I made the light source these things, so like the edge here was brighter and it goes away into darkness on the backside. Um, the reason that I, I you wanna start with something fairly bright. So like if you're going over black primer, you're gonna have a lot longer road to to hoe here because you know green is naturally very transparent. And I would really recommend you start over a bright color primer. Like I focused in pretty hard on these with a white primer to get them nice and bright to begin with. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, your life's just gonna get a heck of a lot easier if you do the same, okay? So we get a nice even base coat of that down there. Simple, nice and green. Also, while I'm waiting for that to dry, what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll just kind of, since this is my mid-tone, and I'll just kind of splash some of this green around on the base where I know I'm gonna have it casting some glow, just to kind of set up some of my OSL. It's not gonna be really like, I'm not focusing on it at this point. I just know some of these things are gonna be green. So why not start spreading it around just so we get a little of that glow and I get kind of the idea of what's going on and where I want that that light to be. Kind of dry brush it out there. If you got paint on the brush and you're waiting for something to dry, why waste time? That's what I say. All right? Okay. So. There we go. All right. So the first thing we're actually going to do is we're going to sketch in our shadows. So, whenever you're doing warp stone, it usually has some kind of hard edge. Like in this case, by the way, the question will probably come up of where are these gemstones from? Are these like crystals, these Superman Fortress of Solitude crystals? Um, these are resin that I cast out of Hearst Arts molds. Um, Hearst Arts has a, one of their, one of their um, molds has like these deep 
cool crystals on them, so I made a bunch of them because I just think they're super cool and useful. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of the green ink and a little bit of my this, so go into that. We want it to be a little darker. Then I'm going to take some of my darker ink and just kind of pull it in there. Let's get a little more green in there, a little bit more of that, and we'll kind of go up into there. Okay, so what I get is a nice deep color like that. Maybe a little bit more of that ink. It's really powerful, so you got to be careful. You can see I just like put a touch in there and instantly it gets like real dark. Wick off the excess since we're working in inks. Now, if I assume that light is interacting with these things, but they're also glowing, I want to pull the shadow up here like this. And so what we try to do is, you notice how I'm alternating, right? And I'm pulling more shadow toward the top. All right, so here again. So like if this is the top, it's kind of at an angle. So I kind of run that corner, but then I focus some of the shadow up top. You notice I'm using like a big fat brush here because I don't need to be careful at this stage. Sometimes you can run the shadows next to each other. It's not the biggest deal. Like that's going to happen up here up top, right? I would repeat the same thing here. You notice I'm like using the side of the brush more than I'm using the tip. So that way it's gathering at the top. Okay. So there we go. Now we got some nice shadows. I won't do all the crystal. I'll, I'll focus on this crystal. Actually, here we can. I'll just sketch this one real fast. There we go. All right. So once we've got our shadows established, now I'm going to get my lines that I'm going to be working on. So here I'm going to go into my my ivory. And I want just a little bit of yellow in there because I want everything to have this tinge of yellow. Warpstone shouldn't ever really go like minty green. So we keep using the yellow because when I just try to combine, if I just try to put the yellow into the, or sorry, if I just try to put the green into the white, what I'm going to get instantly is like, you know, double mint gum. Okay. And that's not what I want here. Like I want there to always be a yellow color to it. So now we come to the magic of edge highlighting. So there's two ways to do this. One, I can take, uh, a, you know, I've, wick, I've wicked a lot of the excess paint off my brush and I can come in and I can just take the side of the brush and I can hit that angle. And assuming your angles are sharp enough, it should be a really fast, easy process. You notice I'm just barely touching this thing. Like, I mean, I'm getting my brush in the general zip code of this thing and like barely making contact. You know, sometimes I'll miss a few times and have to like go in and hit it. That's okay. I don't need to get it in one swipe, right? I wanna make sure, and then basically we're gonna get every single hard angle. Okay. So, we'll do it a little quicker here on the second one. The key is not having too much paint on the brush and very light touches. So I can just swipe at it with the side of the brush. Nice and light, nice and careful, but at the same time, we can do it nice and fast. I hear a lot of people struggle with edge highlighting, and sometimes when, like, I think oftentimes the struggle with edge highlighting comes from the fact people try to do this. They try to come in here and trace like this. 
And certainly there are some models where the angles are so annoying that like are so hidden that you can't get a brush sideways. And so you may have to do that, but that's not the case here. You know, oftentimes with these stones, you don't need to do that. Now, some of the warp stone you'll encounter out in the world, like on actual Skaven models, is very irregular, okay? So what I mean is like, it, uh, it doesn't have this really perfect, you know, like I said, Fortress of Solitude shape, right? So when you run into that, that's fine. You can still do the same thing. It's just if it's really irregular, like sort of say the back of the warp lightning cannon or something, you can just dry brush it very lightly. Like the key would be to get almost all of the paint off your brush. Like you really want no paint, like wipe it until you think you've wiped it to the correct amount and then wipe it more. And then dry brush that thing like 18 million times and you will just barely pick out the edges and you'll get just the nice sharp edges and nothing else. The key with clean dry brushing more than anything is just patience. A lot of people try to like, you know, dry brush once and call it a day. Like they just wanna, they just wanna run up, touch it once and be like, okay, I'm done now. There, I did my thing. That should be it. Uh, the longer you take with it and the more careful you are, the better it'll be. Okay, so now you can see we're already starting to get a nice look here because we those edges make all the difference in the world. Okay, now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring a little bit more of this green, this fluorescent green, and a little bit of my emerald into this, along with just another touch of yellow. I wanna warm it up just a little more. There we go. Now, how much is the right amount? I don't know, some amount that looks right for a highlight, because now we're gonna sketch our highlights. So what I do is now I'm gonna come in here and in the opposite corner of where I put the shadows, we're gonna make some light. You notice again, I'm not trying to be perfect. In fact, get rid of this brush, it's too small. Let's get back to the real brush. There we go. I need some more, I need some more weight, okay. Get back to our good old size eight. Start living that James Wapple lifestyle. Okay. So we just sketch in our highlights here. The key is to work in that yellow into the highlight. You want the warp stone to feel nice and yellow, nice and warm. You want that light in there. The real key with this, just like any gemstone, is contrast. Now, unlike a standard brown gemstone, we don't have a place where the, the light's entering in a traditional sense to make like our white spot highlight. So instead, we're doing that with the edges. You notice the lower parts are brighter away from the light still though. Okay. So now you can see we've got that nice brighter color. We can maybe even push it a little farther. Let's pull in just a little bit more white here. And we can hit a couple of these, bring it way up. Just like in the very corner. In the end, you can play with this a little. It's not exact science, like like all miniature painting. This isn't, if you want exact science, I would recommend you get out of miniature painting and get into like, I don't know, chemistry or advanced math or something like that. This is art or some approximation of it. So we're just really kicking up those those edges, so you can see we're trying to really get that glow in there. And 
That side's a little bugger to get to there, isn't he? There we go. Okay. So, now we have our very extreme transitions, right? So now we're going to smooth this all out. All right. So to smooth it out, we're gonna take something like our mid-tone. So that was this one where we started out. Get a little more of both these in here, get this kind of stronger. But I wanna brighten it up just a little. So I'm gonna pull this down here and mix in some of that fluorescent. Because in the end, I want it to be a little brighter. Test it over there, see how it looks. Yep, okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just pull toward our shadow. And we just kinda Glaze that up in there, always pulling up into the shadow. Now you notice I'm not covering the whole light spot I made. And I just kind of play with the colors start softening that shadow up because I don't want it to be that strong. All right. In the end, we don't want there to actually be this much black. So I just keep working my way around the gem with the glazes, softening that transition. Maybe I'll pull in a little bit of the yellow. We'll get a brighter color. And we'll really focus that right there on that edge. The key is you just keep working it, right, until we smooth that out. Every time we hit it and we put a new glaze over it, you notice it softens that edge just a little bit. Now, if you, I went really strong with the initial black. If you don't want to apply as many glazes, you can also be a little more subtle with your initial touch, and that'll be fine. I like having the strong shadow and pushing back. Your mileage may vary. In the end, you can, you can take whatever tactic works best for you. There's no singular right way to do this, as always. But you notice all I'm doing is I just keep picking different points on my green spectrum and then dropping it here in the middle. To smooth it out. I can come back if I need to. I can reestablish one of my highlights. The addition of the white will be very strong, so if you have shadows you absolutely can't back out. Like if you go way too strong, like if one of your shadows, like that one right there, like right here, it's so strong. Mixing a little bit of the white paint in, that will kill your the edge of your shadow like well and good because you're suddenly adding an opaque paint back in there. It'll also make that gem a lot brighter, but then you can come in sort of a darker version, maybe like that. And then we can just blend it right up. So you've got options. You can always, always, always back out your work through the magic of how powerful this ivory is, or any, like this is a particularly good ivory from Pro Acryl, but any ivory will have these sorts of properties. 
Ivory is just a naturally opaque color, so it's going to act like that. Now you notice I'm still not being like absolutely careful. Like you've probably watched me walk over top of some of my blends a few times. Okay. That's fine. Like that is to say, or I, I hit one of my edges and made too much, you know, like kind of covered up a bright spot or covered up an edge. That's okay. No big deal. Okay. So, once you're happy with sort of the state of your your blends, which I'm not on this yet, but I don't want to sit here and do this forever with you. <laughs> you might get a little bored if you're not already. You get the general idea. We just soften this up. If you don't want to spend this long getting this like really long transition, as I said, just soften your initial shadow. Make it much more green and really carefully work it. I like the effect because I like the sort of disappearing shadow underneath that you get. I think that looks kind of cool. And you get that by, you know, putting all these like semi-transparent layers over each other of glazes. I wouldn't get that if I had a little softer color right out of the gate. But again, as always, your mileage may vary. And you can do this in whatever way you like best. Okay. So you can see there we've got a really nice glow going on. Like, I think that looks like some pretty great warp stone. Now, the reason it looks so bright is because we're running that whole contrast. Our final step, assuming, I'm just gonna assume that I'm in a good place here. Our final step would be to come in and we're going to grab a little bit of that very bright color, like our highest highlight, and we're going to re-edge everything very carefully. That's why I wasn't too worried about being exactly accurate on that first one pass, because I knew I was going to come back and do this again. And you might say, well, Vince, why did you bother to do that at all? Well, because it gave me my lines. I needed to know where I was working, right? There's a value, like, when you're edge highlighting, I honestly like to, I usually edge highlight my models as I'm working on them a couple times. Which maybe sounds excruciating to you, I understand. But I do it because then it gives me a very clear pattern for how I want to work. And I, I can then see, like, basically I can work within the lines. I mean, it sounds silly, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. The other thing we can do, the other thing we're going to do here as our final step is we're going to reinforce our highest highlights and our lowest shadows. So, once we've reestablished all of our edges, okay? Once we've reestablished all those, then what we're going to do is just really push that contrast to the absolute max. So I'm gonna take, and this is also our cleanup stage, because like not all of our, our colors on the corners are exactly where we would want them. So I'll take that very bright color, and I just kind of push it there lightly into the very corner. Push it there lightly into the very corner. Make sure that I'm really, because just a little touch of that makes all the difference in the world. See how much brighter that seems just because of that tiny little touch. When you're working with stuff like this, it you don't the a small little touch of high contrast makes all the difference. Okay? And in fact, it being minimal is what sells it because if it's super bright everywhere, you will lose it. But one tiny white dot amongst a black field will be very 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 visible, right? This is also our chance to smooth out any lines we have, make sure everything's nice and sharp. In the same way, I'll take my deepest shadow and I'll make sure everything is nice and clean, like I can back out my edges up here, 
can make sure that everything is nice and tight right at the edge. If my line, if my edge highlighting got a little squidgy at any point or my coverage wasn't perfect, this is my chance to fix that up. And really make sure those edges are nice and dark, right? And so then you just work your way around the gem. Like you can see there how that's not truly even. Right? See how it's kind of inconsistent? We don't want that. We want a nice, solid, dark color up there. Right, that way we get that nice established shadow. And that's it. That's how you do warp stone. Again, the real key with getting your warp stone low is your contrast. So, you start with a nice mid-tone of your green, whatever you like. You push a nice deep shadow into wherever the side toward the light is. I understand this thing is giving an inner glow, but we still want it to respect whatever outer light is in the world. That'll, that'll, selling that just makes your brain make sense. And that also helps you just set a direction. Then you come in and set your highlight in the opposite corner. You want a nice yellow tone to it, especially for warpstone. It should never go white, green. It should never get minty. It should always be, you know, have this yellow sickliness to it. If you overshadow, you can always mix in a little ivory and go up higher than you would to smooth out that edge and then just glaze back over top. But once you've set your, your shadow and your highlight from there, you just smooth it out. Remember, sharp edges are your friend. If you're dealing with something with an irregular surface that isn't like this, dry brushing can always work. Uh, this is also an excellent candidate if you've got a big enough space for doing things like wet blending, like you saw me do a couple weeks back with the cloak. Um, so like if I had a bigger space, if I was trying to do a big old chunk of warp stone, I could do that all with just a nice solid wet blend. It's a little bit harder in a tiny space like this. You could do it. It's just you need a really stiff, sharp brush. But there you go. I'm going to continue just smoothing this out a little bit, make sure it's nice and even. I'll throw a picture up at the end. But that's warp stone. If you liked that, go ahead and give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you're interested in taking a class with me, I have my teaching schedule down below. You can find that link there. I really do appreciate you watching this one, though, very much. And as always, 